We often think of the 19th century as a time when um, there were separate spheres. Men did some things, women did other things, and there wasn't a lot of um, crossing over, of a mingling. Um, and that really was not true of the transcendentalist movement. It was a time, I think, before that rigid separation of spheres and when you know men were disenchanted with their professions and with their male colleges and women were seeking more. And it was this rare moment when men and women were conversing, as Margaret Fuller said. I'm really excited by the way Paul has captured that aspect of the movement in his music and in the libretto for our transcendentalist passion. I mean, as the 19th century wore on and turned into the 20th century and colleges and universities kind of codified a, a, a canon of American literature that left out the women, and that really was not true to, to this movement by any means. And Paul was very sensitive to that, and I would say uh, if anything, you're hearing more women's voices than men's voices. Women's voices were often quite appealing, personal, um, less abstract. And so you hear full poems by Margaret Fuller, by Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, by Louisa May Alcott um, that really anchor this piece in uh, a Sacred Heart tunes with these, uh, the words of these very forward-thinking, uh, brilliant women. Margaret Fuller was really kind of a mystic, more so than some of the other women, um, and she, there were a lot of symbols that she was drawn to. One was the Ouroboros, the snake that is a circle and it's, uh, it's kind of eating its tail. Um, and she converted this into a poem that she called Double Triangle, Serpent and Rays. It's a very short poem, but it really speaks for the kind of um, integrated world of souls that she saw, and I'm just going to read it to you. It's, it's one of the chorales in Paul's piece. Patient serpent, circle round, till in death thy life is found, double form of godly prime, holding the whole thought of time. When the perfect two embrace, male and female, black and white, soul is justified in space, dark made fruitful by the light, and centered in the diamond sun, Time, eternity are one. It's a beautiful poem, and she drew this image herself and used that as the frontispiece in her great book, Woman of the 19th Century, which was published in 1845, became a bestseller, crossed uh, the Atlantic and was a, a big seller in England as well, made her reputation as um, really America's first feminist. Not a term that people were using then, feminism, but it, it uh, she was looked to as the um, founder of the women's movement in the United States. She was born in Cambridge in 1810, was a brilliant thinker as a child, uh, became part of the Transcendentalists in, in her 20s. She was the editor of their publication, The Dial. But New England wasn't even enough for her. She went down to New York, wrote for Horace Greeley's Tribune, became a kind of pioneering, muckraking journalist, and then went off to Europe in 1848, the year of all the European revolutions, which she said, once she landed in Rome, this is my revolution, my America, in a way, off there in Italy, where they were trying to get independence from um, colonial powers and from the Pope. Um, she took part in that revolution. She had an affair with a young soldier in the Civic Guard. She gave birth to a child out of wedlock, all of this in secret as she's writing dispatches home to the uh, New York Tribune that are published and disseminated all over the country so that you know everyone knows what's going on in Italy. She was the only uh, journalist there during the siege of Rome. And as she was coming back, from Italy with her then now husband and two-year-old son. Very sadly, the ship that they were on went down just off of Fire Island near New York City and all three of them were drowned. She was only 40. Oh,